Well, thanks a lot, Ben, for that nice introduction. And thank all you for coming out on this gorgeous day. I mean, if I had my brothers, I'd be out on the trail to get some more flowers. But thanks so much for, you know, I, I just I just am so pleased to see such a turnout. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. And thanks, too, to the staff of the Grant Cottage for, you know, inviting me to speak to you here. This is such an historic place. Just, uh, you know, this cottage with, with all its intimate artifacts of of uh, President Grant's life as he fought to, to complete his memoirs before he died. It's just, it's just such an amazing sight. And, you know, it's such a beautiful sight here, too, atop Mount McGregor, that it's completely understandable why he would seek healing and comfort here. Now, I know if you come up here, you're probably interested in history. Um, I'm not a historian. I'm an amateur naturalist. Um, but I do remember a particular historical event that was just foundational to me as a naturalist, and that was back in the mid-1990s when these surrounding mountains became part of Moreau Lake State Park. And I'm going to show you on the map. Let's see, i got to make sure I get the right one. Anyway, this picture actually is of the Luzerne Mountains. We're, look, we're up high, I'm up high in the Palmer Town Range. By the does anybody know what the Palmer Town Range is? No, no. Okay, well, those are the mountains you see when you're driving up Route 9 or the north way and you look off to the west, you know, there's a bunch of mountains over there. That's the Palmer Town Range. And, um, you know, we're not, we're not within the blue line, so we're not officially part of the Adirondack Park, but we're definitely part of the Adirondack uh, Mountains. We're part of the Laurentian Shield. It's a geologic... Uh, uh, uprising, and we are part of the Adirondacks, even though we're not within the blue line. So, but the Palmer Town Mountains basically form. Well, I'll show you on that. Let's see, make sure I push the right button here. Here we are. I put my glasses back on. So, just let's just um, situate ourselves. Here's the Hudson River. Uh, here we are. We're down here at uh, Grant Cottage, and here's Murrow Lake State Park. And this used to be the full extent of Murrow Lake State Park, right around the lake, the beach, the campgrounds. That was uh, Murrow Lake State Park. And uh, these are the Palmer Town Mountains. You can see, can you see all the little ISO lines going yeah. up here? Mm -hmm. um, these are the mountains that stand along the river. But back in the mid 1990s, uh, uh, the state grant, uh, purchased all this land. It extended not just to the river, but across the river on into uh, Warren County. So we own uh, significant uh, lands over here in Warren County. And, um, and just, of course, just recently we acquired these lands over here, which includes Lake Bonita. And uh, Grant Cottage then became part of, uh, historic, of state parks and historic uh, places. Um, okay. Um, so... We're situated here. We can see what we belong. Yeah. And, and now we're going to have more lands that extend along the river up here. We have about a thousand more acres. This this is about over six thousand acres now, and we'll soon acquire land. We'll we'll go up into this mountain. That's called the Baker property, and then the old Finch Pine lumber lands along Butler Road are going to be part of the park as well. So we're really expanding. Yes, ma'am. The colored the colored section in the middle there. What is that? Uh, that's the dam. That's, that's the uh, Spire Falls Dam. Thank you. Um, I don't know why it's exhaling red. I suppose they forbidden to do. No trespassing. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, this is quite an, quite an historic event for me as a naturalist. Uh, I've been paddling. I've been paddling the river um, for years. And I'd been gazing up at these mountains, longingly, couldn't wait to get up there and explore them, but there were no trails. And I, I tried a couple times and I promptly got lost. So I was really excited when we finally got access to it. So anyway, I had been paddling all 20 years or more on the river. Now you can see why I really enjoyed paddling on the river. It's absolutely gorgeous. These little back bays, all these beautiful flowers. And it's a remarkable riverside because these are plants that that can tolerate not just seasonal flooding, I mean, everybody gets wet in the spring when the spring, you know, snow melt and uh, spring rains, but these plants can tolerate being uh, inundated every day as the dam operations cause the river to go up and down. So we have a really remarkable 
a bunch of plants, riparian species that grow along the river. More beauties. Um, really beautiful. There's swamp milkweed in there and pickerelweed. Yeah, here's a whole bunch. Isn't that beautiful? Look at the variety of flowers. And most of those I had never seen before in my life until I got my little canoe, uh, which allowed me to paddle there by myself. But as soon as we got access to those trails, man, I was up. Um, there's my pal Sue on the right here. She's here today. And, uh, uh, you know, climb up. In fact, I helped groom some of those trails. There were trails. This is the first overlook off the of Spire Falls Road from the spring uh, trailhead. A spectacular view of uh, looking up toward the Adirondacks and the bend of the river. <clears throat> so um, we're going to go up there on the mountain with me and we're going to walk on some of the trails. Um, they're obviously, the, the mountain beautiful in every season. This is, of course, obviously autumn. But when we go up there in the spring, we're going to see shadow trees blooming on the mountainside. It's almost like a, an orchard up there with all this beautiful. This is the earliest of uh, bush to bloom in the spring. Has many different names: shadow, service berry, June berry. Um, early a native uh, shrub has a little beautiful fruits that are coming right right now. And if you have one of these trees in your yard, it's full of catbirds or bluebirds or especially the. Um, Cedar wax wings just love these berries. <coughs> but this is a beautiful side of the mountain. So we're up here in the spring. And uh, along the trail, we're going to see this beautiful, uh, this is called maple, uh, maple leaf by Burnham. You can see the leaves um, look like maple leaves, yeah. but it's really a viburnum. It has a beautiful white flowers touched with pink. <clears throat> and uh, whoops, we missed one. Oh, well. <laughs> Up on the rocky, rocky ledges, we'll find, this is early saxifrage. It's growing along a waterfall, so it's, it's, it's damp, and it likes damp places, early saxifrage. So this is by waterfall that dampens it with its spray. And uh, uh, the trailhead uh, around the spring, a uh, whole bunch of red trillium there, just a beautiful uh, trillium. But if we go on up higher into the mountains, and we enter some of the hemlock woods, where it's completely shady and cold, uh, we're going to find uh, painted trillium. Painted trillium really likes it. It's the, about the only wildflower I ever find under hemlocks. Hemlocks are very dark. Um, they create a very dark shade, and also I think their needles uh, uh, create a, an acidity that most plants don't like, but the painted trillium really loves it there. Now, this is a really beautiful uh, early spring flower. This is trailing arbutus. Uh, it's as fragrant as it is beautiful. And those leaves look kind of shot because they've been under the snow all winter. They don't put out new leaves until after the flowers fade. Um, they're extremely fragrant, but I need to caution you, if you want to smell those flowers, you're going to have to get down and stick your nose in because if you try to pick one or even lift it up to your nose, you'll disturb the root system. This is, despite being a tough little plant that survives the coldest winters, if you disturb the root system of even one flower, it might destroy the whole patch. So, beautiful to look at, delightful to smell, but you got to get down to smell it. Can't pick it. I think it's protected by law, too. Not that anybody ever gets caught picking wildflowers. <laughs> but there's a $25 fine, I think. I don't know if anybody's uh, ever been fine. Um, this is uh, the uh, trailing arbutus also comes in pink. This is early in the morning. Must have been a dewdrop on it. Beautiful little flower. Early spring. And of course violets. We got violets, violets, violets. These are the little uh, northern white violets. Um, one of the first violets to bloom in the spring. Also fragrant. They love it where it's damp. They'll spread across the uh, damp soil up where the springs are in the mountain. And this is a flower that really likes it hot and dry out in the rocky, sandy places. This is called the ovate leaf violet. You can see how, can you see how fuzzy those leaves and stems are? So it's really, it's a really furry one. And when it first comes up, the flowers are bigger than the, than the leaves. So it's kind of a cute little plant. It's ovate leaf violet. And this is the round leaf violet, lemon yellow. It's just really a beautiful yellow violet. Very early bloomer. Goes along the trails in the woods. 
And uh, wherever there are uh, vernal pools or springs that, that dampen the soil up in the mountains, you're going to find these beautiful, uh, this is called uh, miterwort or bishop's cap. And these little tiny flowers, I, I wish I'd put a picture of their a close up of them. They look like snowflakes, they have this beautiful little fringe on them. Other flowers in the damp area, this is called gold thread. Um, this, this flower doesn't really have any petals that I know of. Those white things are actually the sepals. And maybe the yellow jelly pops are <laughs> petals, or they might be nectaries. I haven't got any botanist, I'm not a real botanist, but I do have a real botanist friend. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I, no, nobody's been able to tell me the, the true terms for this plant, but it is it interesting? Those little yellow jelly things and those spindle shaped, I do know that those are, uh, uh, those are the thistles on the plant. And it's called bow thread because if you were to put your finger down and dig up a little root, which I don't want you to do, but I've done it, <laughs> um, the, the roots are very fine uh, thread-like roots and they're bright yellow, bright yellow, which is how it gets the name bow thread. And this is, uh, it's called foam flower. Looks very foamy, doesn't it? Yeah, Tiarella cordifolia. Beautiful flower in the damp parts of the forest. And um, in the, you'll see just carpets of, this is a plant called winterberry. Wintergreen, sorry, folks. Here I did it again. <laughs> Wintergreen, winterberry is the shrub. This is a, well, this is kind of shrubby. It's a woody plant and it's evergreen, you'll see. And it'll have these red berries from last year. These berries stay red throughout the winter, and so and the leaves stay green. Um, they will have little yellow, I mean, sorry, white bell-shaped flowers uh, coming on just about now, but um, they'll have berries all throughout the year, and they're very tasty. They taste just like wintergreen. Um, are we all old enough to remember wintergreen? Or tea berry, tea berry gum? <laughs> Excuse me? Yes. Can the birds eat the winterberries? I, if they eat them, I don't. They they don't eat them in great numbers because they're still there. Okay. I you know what is like the the shad berries. I mean they're gone overnight. When those when those cedar wax wings descend, you know they take every berry. But I don't know. I, you know I don't know who eats them. Okay. They don't. I don't think they have a lot of nutrition. So maybe they're starvation food for animals. But um, also they're under the snow in the winter, so they can't get at them. But here's another uh, ground cover uh, plant that's evergreen. Its leaves can be told by that light, if they're rounder than the wintergreen leaves and they've got a, a whiter vein that, that marks the uh, center of the leaf. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, little twin trumpets of white flowers that will be, they should be blooming about now. And it takes two of those flowers to make one berry. I don't know if you can, whoops, sorry. Right? Went to, I pushed something that I meant to push the pointer. All right, pointer. I don't know if you can see these two little dots on the berry. That means it's got two blossom ends. I don't know any other fruit that requires two flowers to make one berry, but this is it, partridge berry. All right. Okay, this is a little later in the summer, in the spring. Yeah, this would be about now. I'm, um, on another side of the park, in the mountain range, this is over on the Baker Trail, leads up to a beaver pond way up high in the mountains that's completely filled with wild calla. Uh, here we go. Here's a close up of the wild calla. It looks like the peace lily. It's, it's definitely related to an arum species. That's actually the flower in the middle. The white part is just a um, spade. The flowers are little, these little dots along the spadix. So each of these little dots is an individual flower. Wild calla. And sharing that wild calla pond is a you know beautiful clumps of our native wild iris. This is the native blue flag, iris versicolor. Here's a little closer picture of it. Isn't that beautiful? How we like it we have such beautiful wildflowers. And up there, too, we found a couple of very interesting trees. This is a black tupelo tree. It's probably a very old one. You know, just five miles away in the Lincoln Mountain State Forest, we have black tupelos that are maybe 800 years old. Uh, six to 800, they've been core sampled at between six and 800 years old. 
And they look about like this one, so nobody's core sampled these up in, this was up in the swamp up on the Baker Trail in the uh, Palmerton Mountains. What kind of tree? A uh, black tupelo. This is sabbatica. You know, it's remarkable because we think of tupelo as a southern forest tree, mm -hmm. and we, believe it or not, have a moderated climate along the Hudson Champlain Valley. Apparently it's just humid enough, because of the water, to support some of our southern forest trees, including the black tupelo and uh, sassafras. I'm sure maybe you all know sassafras grows in the woods around here too. So we're lucky we have some of these trees. And as I say, they're not recent introductions. They've been here from the beginning of time, the cannibal time. But there's one up there along that calicon. There's also a chestnut up there that's old enough and big enough to bear fruits. I mean, I, these are the huffs. I didn't find the nuts, whether they've been eaten or else it was a sterile tree because there was no other uh, chestnut close enough to cross-pollinate. But there's lots of uh, chestnut pods up there. And here's a little, I hear a lot of people think this is a fungus, but this is a flower. <coughs> It has uh, pollen and it, it creates seeds, um, uh, but it has no chlorophyll. So how the heck does it eat? I mean, all you know, green plants they use their green color, their chlorophyll to create nutrients from the light. But this has to this has to suck up nutrients from something else. It's a parasitic plant. It gets its nutrients from uh, parasitic uh, attachment to roots in the ground. I'm not quite sure what plants it has to be parasitic on, but it's certainly parasitic. But it's interesting and beautiful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And eventually those, it's called, did I tell you what it was? No. <laughs> We're waiting. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, 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 it has a common name of Indian pipe, because um, it looks like a pipe. It's also called corpse flower. It's kind of a creepy name. I like Indian pipe better. <laughs> and uh, the, when, after they're pollinated, those, plant, those flowers will turn straight up. So it must be pollinated by ants or some other creature that can get underneath and come into that flower to uh, pollinate it. But um, sometimes they have a little tinge of pink on them too. They can be quite pretty. I saw my first clump this morning in uh -huh. the park. Well, oh, they're up now, so it's a good time to go looking for them. It still, had, it still had a lot of oak leaves around it uh -huh. so pushing up. Oh. Wow. That's great. You know, it's amazing. Sometimes I find plants that come up and they come right through oak leaves. I mean, oak leaves are tough. Yeah. <laughs> How does that plant push its way through? I mean, the plants are tender. How do they get? I don't know. I think, I don't know. I, you know, I've asked people and nobody's given me an explanation. <laughs> Mysteries remain. <laughs> oh, if that one was pale, this one sure ain't. <laughs> this, is, this is gorgeous. This is one of our prettiest little spring wildflowers. And you know, a lot of people walk right by it and never see it because it's, it's actually quite small. Um, maybe an uh, inch and a half across for a flower. <clears throat> it's also called gay wings. I think you can see, to me it looks like a little airplane with wings and a little propeller and twirl. It's, uh, it's a milkwort. Um, milkwort plants don't have milky sap. I think some at some point somebody thought they'd help promote milk production, but I, you know, that's all folk wisdom. Some folk wisdom, don't get me wrong, is good, but some is really off the wall. What else we got? Okay, we've been looking. We've been looking now uh, at all the plants of the forests and along the trails of the forest, and now we're going to go look at some of the sunny area plants. Um, uh, through the mountains, we have the power lines that run. Of course, uh, the Spire Falls Dam produces a lot of electricity, and a lot of the wires from the Spire Falls Dam run through the Palmatone Range. <coughs> uh, yeah. This is right up above the dam, in fact, up in the high hills. But, uh, the, you know, the clear-cut areas under the power lines actually reproduce the areas that we used to have in natural forests created by forest fire. We don't let forest fires burn anymore. So we have the power lines that do the job for us. They create these clearings in the middle of the woods, and we do get a, a whole different set of plants that grow there. Some of them are really beautiful. Um, these are, uh, they should be coming in, for, they're about two weeks late this year, but uh, they're usually in bloom around the, uh, the spring of the vernal equinox. But I haven't found them yet. Uh, wood lilies. They're beautiful wood lilies. 
Um, here's a little closer view. They're just a spectacular uh, flower. It's hard to believe it's a native flower. You know, when I put my head down, I get loud. Am I, am I loud enough for you all to hear if, yes. I, if I don't put my head down? <laughs> oh, my brother, look at you. I'm not a double chin. <laughs> Wood lilies. Yeah, Lilium philadelphicum. Hard to believe it's a native flower. It almost looks like a... Or I don't know if these can be cultivated because you don't see them in people's gardens. But don't you dare dig them up. <laughs> where, where do you find them? Uh, most uh, most uh, open sunny areas. Um, uh, these were growing in the uh, power line at the top of Mud Pond. How many? And, uh, how many did it use? Oh, did you ask me how many? No, I'm asking. <laughs> oh, what? Tell how many we found. Oh, well, the first year, my friend Sue and I found them. We found, what, like 85 and 100 yards? And then, of course, power line is really scared about plants under their minds. They're afraid we're going to grow up and <laughs> get in the middle of the wire. So they spray herbicide and they kill everything. I think it was five years before we saw any more blue lilies under the line. But now they tend to more to cut stuff and poison it. But they'll probably be back. I don't know. Sometimes when there's a water body like mud pond, they might avoid spraying poisons there because it does kill the aquatic species. Anyway, we all love with lilies. Um, also in the power lines, you'll see this uh, looks this uh, this little shrub um, looks like exploding fireworks of stars. Um, it's called New Jersey tea. Uh, it was probably I guess it was used uh, by you know probably by the tax tax resistors, <laughs> you know the tea party folks back in the beginning of our country uh, to make tea with. I've tried it; it's pretty tasteless. Uh, so you know leave it. <laughs> It's a, it's a beautiful shrub, and the pollinators just love it. It's almost always full of beetles and bugs and bees. And uh, there's some more of the New Jersey tea, but what's still in the show here is a, is a butterfly weed. It's a butterfly milkweed, milkweed. It's called butterfly weed because, boy, did the butterflies love it. Oh, this is one of those butterflies that love it. This is... Of course, we all know that the monarchs love milkweed, right? But so do other butterflies. This is American copper. Um, it looks gray when its wings are closed, but when it opens its wings, it's bright orange. You can see how brightly orange it would be. It's like it dressed for dinner to match the, to match the decor of the dining hall. So did this guy. Look how pretty this guy is. You know, when people say pollinators, they almost always think honeybees. Honeybees are a very minor part of the pollination system of our plants. Um, they're important for agriculture because honeybees are single-sided. When they start eating one plant, they, they stick to that plant, so they'll pollinate a whole crop. We have many, many species of native bee. Um, their, their tastes are more catholic. They will pop around from flower to flower, and they won't pollinate an entire crop necessarily. Um, but anyway, wasps and flies, bugs, beetles, all kinds of bugs are, are pollinators. So. When people say we need to protect pollinators, not just the honeybees. And there's no reason to be afraid of this wasp. You know, this is a solitary wasp. This, oh, this is a gold, it's called a great golden digger wasp. It's called a digger wasp because it digs a hole in the ground where it lays its eggs and does not have a colony to defend, so it's very plastic. You could actually pick this one up. It probably, probably, it saves its sting for its prey. It's probably some insect or caterpillar that it stings. I should have researched that. Sorry. Well, I just think it's so beautiful. You can, I don't, can you see all those little golden hairs that are coming yeah. in its yeah. thorax and that gorgeous uh, red and black, I mean orange and black uh, of its abdomen and its legs are also orange. So it's another one who chose his wardrobe to match the day <laughs> And talk about showy flowers under the power lines. I mean, you know, there isn't any match for goldenrod. Goldenrod with spectacular blooms. And you know, goldenrod gets a really bad rap. You know, a lot of people think of goldenrod as, oh my God, would be give me hay fever. Goldenrod does not cause anybody's hay fever unless you stick your nose down in it and <laughs> snort the pollen directly. <laughs> no plant would go to the trouble of producing such fantastically showy flowers if all it had to do was waft its pollen in the air. No, it makes that show, so it says, come on and eat. Let's eat to the bugs. 
and there, it's advertising its pollen. It has very sticky, heavy pollen that does not waft on the air. And you can see it's attracted quite a few bugs here. I think um, we're on the dinner date up there. Was that? <laughs> there's a dinner date up there. Did, well, there's a whole bunch of dinner daters here. It's more um, like after dinner. <laughs> this, in fact, this, was, this is called the goldenrod soldier beetle. But I often make the quip that these soldiers would rather make love than war. <laughs> Get it? Ah. Got it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it's a wonderful, beautiful flower, and it deserves a lot more respect than it gets. And of course, here's the common milkweed. This is the milkweed that most people think of when they think of supporting the monarchs. You know, they were concerned about monarch being under uh, uh, in danger because of its habitat loss. And a lot of people are planting um, milkweed. And the common milkweed is the one that comes most commonly to mind. And it's a beautiful flower. It has a gorgeous fragrance. It's a beautiful uh, plant. Oops, sorry. I got the pointer instead of the... Okay. And yes, here's the monarch. This is, a, this is the butterfly that we're all concerned about. It does like... But also, the, this is a tiger swallowtail. It also likes milkweed. Oh, and it isn't just uh, butterflies that not like milkweed. This is, this is an amazing bug. This is a, a milkweed beetle. Uh, it doesn't just uh, visit milkweed to take a little pollen or sip a little nectar. It lives its whole life on milkweed. Its eggs are made in the milkweed stem, and it completely lives its life on milkweed. And it eats the milkweed leaves. But you remember, I mean, milkweed is called milkweed because it has this milky sap. You know, it's a real sticky stuff, too. It's called, it's a latex. Uh, there's a lot of sticky sap on a milkweed leaf. And if that bug got so much sap in its mouth, it would draw, it would stick, it would glue its mouth shut and it wouldn't be able to eat anymore. And of course, it would starve. So these bugs are not only beautiful, they're smart. They go downstream uh, on the vein from the edge of the leaf and they nip those veins so the milkweed sap runs out. And so by the time they get to the edge, there's no milkweed sap at the edge of the leaf, so they can happily uh, dine to their heart's content. Very interesting bug. It's also interesting because it has four eyes. Can you see the eyes here? Uh, uh, let's see. Here's this better one, two, three, four. But its antennae come out between those sets of eyes. That's interesting. I've never seen any other bug that has antennae that come out between their eyes like that. A beautiful and interesting bug. Milkweed beetle. There's another milkweed. It grows in these sunny areas. It's called the uh, clasping leaf. You can see its leaves clasp the stem. It's also called blunt leaf. It has, well, that's, could be called wavy leaf too, couldn't it? Those are wavy leaves. Um, <clears throat> It's very fragrant, very beautiful. Some, some years it has really vibrant pink flowers, and other years they're kind of dusty gray, dusty pink. I, I don't know why the variation in color, but they do vary in color. A little more unusual than some of the other milkweeds. Uh, this is called polk milkweed. Its, uh, it's scientific name is Asclepias exaltata which I think is a much prettier name than poke milkweed. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, it, the, the flowers, uh, to me, they look like molars, don't they? <laughs> they look like, like pulled teeth hanging now. But uh, an interesting thing, you know, most milkweeds grow out in the sunny areas. This milkweed actually will grow in the shade of the woods. It, it, usually I find it in, in edge, you know, edges, and it's got a lot of shade, but it's got a lot of light, too. Poke milkweed. Uh, I guess this is probably my favorite sunny area flower. This is here. You know, we have lots of asters, and most of them prefer. We have a couple that like the shade of the wood, but most of our native asters love it out in the open, along roadsides and open meadows. This is the New England aster. This color is a little off. It looks more blue than it usually is because it's very vibrant purple. You'll see this in late September, October, along roadsides and in power lines, uh, clear cuts. It's a vibrant purple. It's got big flowers, and it's our only or uh, aster that's this vibrantly purple. So it's immediately 
I guess you could call it 40 mile an hour, Astor, because you could identify it driving by at 40 miles an hour. <laughs> Uh, sunflowers, sunny areas, yeah, we get sunflowers. Of course we get sunflowers. We have so many different species of sunflower, and I didn't mark what, sun, what species this was. It's not the same species that produces birdseed sunflower, or the sunflower seeds we get in the health food store. Um, they're much smaller flowers, about this big. Um, various sunflowers. They're all native. And this is our native ladybug, too. This is a lady beetle. Um, a little different than the one we usually think of in the, you know, the nursery books. This is ladybug. Uh, this is a uh, this is a Monarda species uh, related to the bee ball you grow mm -hmm. in your gardens. It's called wild bergamot. Wild bergamot's name for it. It's really a, a beautiful flower, and those long. Uh, Florets really can't be pollinated by everybody because the nectar is way down at the bottom of those tubes, so it has to be pollinated by something that has a long tongue. <laughs> Butterflies love it, of course, and moths love it, and what the heck is this? <laughs> Looks like a hummingbird. <coughs> oh, the hummingbirds do love these flowers, but this is a hummingbird moth, hummingbird clear wing moth. There's another one that looks like a big fat bumblebee, but this is the one that's redder than the black one, the yellow and black one. Yeah. Pardon? Did somebody have a comment? You look like a kid put it together. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a big moth, and it's, it's fun. It will, it will hover just like a hummingbird. It's a beautiful moth. All right, um, we're going to go up another power line now. The power line I was exploring before ran along the top of uh, Mud Pond or along the river there. And this one climbs up the mountain. This is in the, the new uh, mountainous area that we're about to acquire for the park, the Butler property that was recently acquired. This, uh, this power line cuts right through it. If you're driving along the curve from Spar Falls Road, you see it goes quite steeply up the mountain. And it takes quite a bit of effort to get up here. Uh, my friend Sue comes with me from time to time. <laughs> yes, we've had many adventures up there. <laughs> it's, you know, I suppose in a way we're trespassing. I mean, the power line people don't like it on their property, but, you know, that's where the interesting plants grow. But I don't. I can tell as they fly I'm, 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 I'm a trespasser from way back. <laughs> I just, uh, you can see the Hudson River way down there. So we're way up high, and th this particular stretch of river, uh, of um, sorry, Caroline, has an amazing different bunch of plants. Maybe because of this, it's sort of up high and very rocky. And uh, one of the plants we have up there is this beautiful thistle. This is a native thistle. I mean, most of the thistles we see growing down along roadsides and in meadows is uh, introduced bull thistle or the horrible little flower of Canada thistle. But this is one of our native thistles. Um, this is called pasture thistle. Its flowers are, by God, they're just about as big as my fist. They're huge flowers, very fragrant, and they only grow about knee high. So I think they make a beautiful garden plant. You'd have to wear gloves to put them in, I guess. They are pretty. What's that? There's something behind it. Oh, okay. What was the... No. Uh, that's a black-eyed Susan, I believe. Yeah. Okay, um, this plant is called the round leaf tick trefoil. You can see why it's called round leaf. It's obvious. Uh, the ticks are not the tick that the name refers to is not the dreaded tick that bites us and makes us sick. Uh, it refers to the seed pods that are that will stick to your pants. All that there we have a whole bunch of tick trefoils. Desmodium is the uh, scientific name. Although, yeah, this is still Desmodium. Rotundifolia. Round leaf. Um, it's a pea family plant. Looks like little pea, pea family flowers. But the only I, this is the only place in Saratoga County I ever find this plant. It sprawls on the ground. It's called. Did I tell you what it was? A creeping, creeping tick trefoil, a trailing round leaf tick trefoil. That's what it's called. Uh, I think it's the scientific name is repent. No, it's rotundifolia. Sorry, flattering here. Um, what else we got up here? Oh. This is, uh, this is a St. John's wort. This is one of our native St. John's worts. Um, it's our smallest St. John's wort. It's called orange grass. Orange grass. Now, where do they get the orange? 
Uh, it's got yellow flowers, it's got red buds, it's got red seed pods. It doesn't have any orange. Well, maybe if you put the yellow and the red together, you get orange. Uh, but actually, somebody told me that if you pinch the stem and sniff it, it has a faint citrusy orangey smell. Um, I'll have to try that next time. That's the orange grass. It only grows in uh, rocky outcroppings where the soil is very thin and exposed uh, to the elements. And uh, this is why it's called grass. It doesn't really have any leaves, but it has uh, green stems that are photosynthesized for it. It has little scales on the stems, but a very grassy looking flower. Very small. Well, you can tell how small it was from my finger in the last picture. Orange grass hypericum, or orange grass St. John's word. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to talk about our orchids. Um, you know, most people think orchids, they think of, you know, what you wore to the prom, or maybe your mom wore on her lapel at Easter time. Uh, um, but our orchids, our orchids, yeah, we have some showy ones. Yeah, this is our, probably our showiest orchid. This is the pink lady slipper. Uh, but most of our orchids are not this showy. But this one is. That, that's not out anymore. Well, that comes out in mid-May. Right. Mid-May, mid to late May. And hundreds of them grow in that, along that, actually in the woods along that power line at the top of Glen Pond. Yeah, it likes a really sandy uh, soil under pine. So a bunch of them uh, bloom in the woods at the Wilton Wildlife Preserve. Um, and uh, the Woods Hollow Nature Preserve in Balsam Spa has a lot of them. Uh, but they also thrive along the top of Mud Pond there. Uh, pink lady slippers. Uh, yellow lady slippers do not grow in acidic soil. They only grow in uh, limey soil, so uh, we don't have any yellow. I have not found any yellow lady slippers. The only place I've ever found yellow ones in Skidmore was, yes? Up in Argyle. Okay, you must have some marble or limestone. Yeah. Well, in Saratoga, of course, we're on limestone escarpment because that's how we get all our mineral springs. And the Skidmore Woods is very limey, and you get yellow lady slippers there. But we get the pink ones. And uh, here's, a, here's an orchid that's actually called showy orchids. And this has to have limey soil. So uh, while the pink one, pink uh, lace zipper needs uh, acidic soil, this one needs limey soils. And actually, I had to go across the river to find them. And they're not literally in the Palmer Town Mountains, but they're across the river in, uh, on uh, Morrow Lake State Park land. They like lime in the soil. And here's a, just a little later in this. Spring. Uh, this is probably now this is a greenwood orchid. It likes it in deep shade and swampy. It really likes it wet and it likes it dark. And this is a little orchid. This, we took this picture along uh, in, in the pine woods uh, around Mud Pond. This is called the uh, checkered rattlesnake plantain. Uh, I don't. You can't see the checkers on the leaves very well. Uh, we have two rattlesnake plantains. We have these. This is the uh, downy rattlesnake plantain. They have real tiny white flowers. And here's, they both, they're, both of them have flowers that look pretty much like this. This is a little orchid floret. Um, they all look pretty much alike. And probably their leaves are showier than their flowers. This is the leaf of the downy, of the downy rattlesnake plantain. And it's very beautiful. You find that it's evergreen. You can see that in the wintertime. Uh, this is another flower grows in more late summer. This is uh, August, September. This is uh, the nodding ladies' dresses. Um, it's a pretty common orchid. We find it all around. If we ever get a beach back at Moreau Lake, it grows on the beach around the Bat Bay. I planted over 100 of them there last fall. Have you seen how the waters come up in Moreau Lake? I mean, we, were, we thought we were losing the lake, right? I mean, it was, it was down over four feet vertical distance. So, uh, God, I mean, we even had the U.S. Geologic Survey coming. Are we losing our, our water table? I mean, what's going on? But it's all back. The thing is, we had a lot of rain. We didn't have that much snow, but we had a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, lot of rain. And there's no outlet to Moreau Lake. It's a kettle lake, and so all the, that rain just stays right in there. You know, I was wondering this the other day because Lake Bonita isn't that high. The Lake Bonita has streams that flow out of it. Uh, Lake Bonita does, it has a few little trickles, but it doesn't really have, it doesn't release its water. 
It all stays there. It's Kettle Lake. So I think that's why it's so high. Um, but anyway, there are places up on the mountain here where we can see it grow as thick as dandelions on a suburban lawn. These are the little orchids. You know, most people, when they think of orchids, they think of those big uh, tree orchids like in Florida or Hawaii. But New York has actually more orchids than the tropical states. Our orchids are ground orchids, not tree orchids. And we have almost 60 species of native orchid. And the colder and muckier, the better they like it. So, and most of them are small, and, and you, you wouldn't notice them from uh, standing height. And what time of year do you see them? Uh, well, all through the year. We have early spring ones, the lady slippers are spring, uh, the, the, that uh, greenwood orchid that's midsummer, and then we have a lot of uh, fall orchids. Um, they grow throughout the growing season. Um, I was going to say over 60 species. And we have uh, 18 of those species grow in Monroe Lake State Park. Not all of them up in the mountains. Oh, here's a, <clears throat> we have to wait for fall to see this one. This is called after the fall. Oh, I'm sorry. This is what happens <laughs> when you try to stuff so much in your brain. Your search engine go round and round and round and round. And round, and round. <laughs> My doctor assured me, he said, well, do you ever think of the name when you, when, you know, I, I can't get the name when I want it, but he said, do you ever, and then we had, sure, it pops up when I don't need it. Yeah. Said, That's all right. So it's still in there. <laughs> I always say you have to open the right drawer. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, just like our computer storage, we can go back and wipe out a bunch of junk, but we can't do that with our brain. We got all that stuff in there. Yes, this is late coral root. Blooms in uh, September, October. And guess what? That is in bloom. That's about as much flower. In fact, that's more flower than you get on most of them. I'll show you the flower. It's just this little roughly a petal that sticks out the bottom. It's kind of cute if you look at it real close. It's white with little purple polka dots. <clears throat> but as I say, that's the, uh, that's the, the late, latest orchid I know how to find around here. Okay, um, you know, I could go on and on. I could talk for the rest of the afternoon about lots of flowers that grow on the trails in the mountains up here, but I want to focus for the uh, conclusion of my talk on the flowers that grow on the shores of Lake, on the shores and islands of Lake Bonita. This is one of our, you know, this, we just recently acquired access to Lake Bonita. It was on uh, prison property and forbidden, access was forbidden so, for so many years, um, which of course makes it a very protected wetland. Um, Anyway, it be, when, as soon as it became available to us, well, probably even a little before. <laughs> 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 I did I did I did I did I did Not my friend Sue there. No, she would do that. <laughs> I, think, I, think a, a, I think it was a fish. No, it was wintertime when I trespassed. You know, we finally owned the lake at this point. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's an absolutely, have, have, how many of you people have explored, have explored Lake Bonita? Have, have you been up to see how pretty it is? Then you will agree with me, it really is a beautiful little lake. And so anyway, as soon as Sue and I could get up there, uh, we started exploring it. And oh, we, we could only see what was growing on those little islands with our binoculars. And oh my gosh, look what's going to growing out there. Pitcher plants. Pitcher plants, you know what that means? That means fog. That means there's a whole bunch of plants there that only grow in, a, in a spag, an, an acidic or sphagnum carpeted environment. And, uh, oh, couldn't wait. We're going to get out there in our boats. Uh-uh. No, Park said, no, we won't let anybody paddle on that lake. Because it's, it's been protected for so long, it's absolutely pristine. We have no way to control what people are going to bring in with their boats. Of course, it's pretty hard. I mean, there's no access to that lake except a long, steep trail. <laughs> um, so probably not too many people are going to be uh, driving trailers. I mean, well, there is a way to access it from the old prison land. But anyway, no paddling. Oh, dear. Oh, so you can imagine how heartbroken I was. Except then, you can imagine how excited I was when they said, Jackie, 
Would you like to go out and paddle around those islands and give us a survey of the plants that come out? Oh. So, yay! All right. I got a special permit, and my research associate here was about to come with me, and also a, 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 a biologist, my friend Nancy uh, Slack, um, who knows uh, liverwort, lichens, and um, mosses, came with me. So here I am. We're going to do a little tour of those little islands because they're, they're, they're really a remarkable habitat. They're completely covered with sphagnum moss, which is that, that moss that's growing on the bottom. And it comes in so many different colors. They have red and green and yellow and brown. It's beautiful, very colorful. And the uh, pitcher plant, of course, are very colorful as well. And there's a few other plants. Oh, and here's a little, here's a little cranberry here. And um, these leaves are uh, marsh St. John's wort. So it's very colorful, very pretty. And um, what's next? Uh, oh, they're complete. The most, the, the prominent growth on those little islands are shrubs, covered with shrubs. And the most dominant shrub is the leather leaf shrub, which is shown here. Um, I just wanted to show you a picture with the flowers because they're so cute. They're, they grow, they bloom very early in spring. Um, so I didn't take this picture out on Lake Bonita because I can get out there to in summer. But uh, little bells all in a row. I see that nursery around you, Mary and Mary, quite <laughs> They're very cute. But that's the dominant shrub out there. It's called leather leaf. Holds its leaves all winter. Very leathery, aptly named. Got a long scientific name I can never remember. Uh, the second most popular sh populous shrub out there is this one's called uh, Sweet Gale. It's called Sweet for a reason. It's very fragrant. It's related to bayberry. You know, we get bayberry candles at Christmas time. It has that wonderful aromatic smell. Um, these leaves are full of that same resin, very del deliciously fragrant leaves. Also, those, those are the seed pods that are fruited from the female flower. And if you pinch those, your fingertips are, 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 are fragrant for the rest of the day. Really beautiful smell. I'll smell. Uh, this is probably the most colorful shrub that grows out there. This is sheep laurel. That's a very interesting way of pollinating. I'm going to show you how this works. Can you see how some of the some of the anthers are tucked back into little depressions in the petals? And when a pollinator lands, pop, they pop right out and they bop that pollinator right on the back and shed the pollen. And eventually, you know, some of these have sprung. And some of them are still tucked in. So you know, eventually then they will recurve and, and, and recock ready to spring again. So it's an interesting and beautiful flower. Related to mountain laurel, a bog laurel, um, but a beautiful native plant. And it, it likes bogs. It will also grow in less acidic land, but usually in boggy areas. Here's another, another shrub, not quite as populous as those three. This is called water willow. Also, it's a water loosestripe is another, another name for it. But it's not the nasty purple loosestripe that we don't like as an invasive. This is not invasive. This is a beautiful purple flowered uh, native loosestripe. <coughs> and uh, each of those little islands, they're basically rocky islands. Uh, probably, you know, the ground, probably the tops of boulders Lake Bonita was originally just a marsh, but when, you know, historically, when uh, people populated the mountaintop there, I think it was a hotel there first, and then uh, a hospital and school and prison, uh, the, the, the spring that fed that uh, wetland was dammed to create the lake. And when the water came up, the tops of the boulders and bedrock that protrude from the water are the um, rocky tops of those little islands. Um, <clears throat> So they, they're mostly covered with sphagnum, but they're, they have a sort of a muddy verge, a lot of them, and on that muddy verge grow these plants. And uh, the, the yellow ones with the tall, skinny, uh, skinny stems are, is a, um, um, it's a bladder horn. Horn, bladder horn, yes. Uh, cornuda, I knew it was cornuda, but I couldn't think of, yeah, horn, of course, horn, horn bladder wart. And all this sparkly red stuff, down here, whoops, whoops, well, there's another picture of it. Uh, sparkly red stuff that grows at, grew at the bottom of the horn bladder wart um, is another plant called sundew, spatulate sundew. 
And um, both the bladderwort and the sundew are carnivorous plants. They have no green leaves, so they can't create um, with chlorophyll. But the bladderwort has little little bladders that grow under the under the water, and they'll suck in little tiny bugs and other organisms. Um, and digest them in these little sacks. And the, uh, the sundew has a whole other way of trapping bugs. It has all these sparkly dewdrops around it that look like, oh, something sweet. Ooh, ooh. So the bugs land, and that's, that sweet, that those sparkly drops are not sweet. They are very sticky. And the bug can't get away. And then eventually the leaf uh, folds over it and digests the bug. Those little white flowers belong to the um, sundew. Mm -hmm. Pretty little flowers. Nasty little plant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's only nasty if you're a bug, you know. <laughs> this is another sundew that grows out there. This is the round leaf sundew. And, and once again, it has these sparkly drops. Ooh, come, come, come. And the, that looks like a, a, a damselfly may have landed there. And that's all that's left of that, that plant's lunch. <laughs> um, leftovers. The bug is gone, but the wings remain. That's a flower stem coming. It also also has a, a white flowers. So that's the round leaf sundew. And this is a little white flowered plant called pipewort. Pipewort. Just a little decorative plant. Um, those other islands, as I said, are rocky, are rocky tops. These are another kind of island that you'll find in the lake. These are formed by floating mats of uh, uh, water lily roots and, uh, and mud. And it will probably eventually form a bog mat. Probably uh, the sphagnum will grow on that. We'll have, we will have floating mats because we have these cat, uh, water lily root mats. And you can see the sundew, the bright red sundew is growing on it. And also, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a bunch of little white, uh, yellow speckles down here. See those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's another bladderwort. That's a very tiny little bladderwort. It's called humped bladderwort, <coughs> Euphicularia gimba. Here's a closer look. <laughs> you can see where it got the name humped. It's got a little hump right in the middle. It's got little red stripes on it. I had to really get close to get that picture. <laughs> Luckily, I was out in my boat. <laughs> So, what else is there? Another yellow flower that grows out on the islands. This is called yellow-eyed grass. It's not a grass. It's called xyrus. Um, just another yellow flower. Kind of unusual. Don't see it anywhere else. But it's out there in the middle of Lake Bonita. Aha, this is the, this is the one I really wanted to get out to see. This is probably our prettiest little native orchid. It's called rose begonia. And this does look like the kind of orchid you might have worn to the prom, doesn't it? It's really pretty. It's only about that big around, though, but you'd have to have a bunch of them to make a corsage. <laughs> Very pretty. Rose pagonia. Pagonia ophiovasoides. So, man, that's a beautiful... And, and the little islands, they have lots of them, dozens of them grow out there. You can see them through binoculars if you stand on the shore. They should be blooming right about now, so if you want to walk up the trails and look through your binoculars, I bet you see them. And of course, we have the floating, you know, plants that we see in most lakes. We have the beautiful, fragrant water lily. Do you know? Have, has anybody here ever seen a, a water lily with, you know, shrivel, gone brown? They always look perfect, absolutely pristine, perfect. They never die. They never shrivel. But you know what? They do. But it's all down in the water. Because as soon as they're pollinated, their stem says takes them and jams them right down into the mud. Um, because uh, once it's pollinated, the seed will form, but it's, it goes down and deposits that uh, fertilized ovary in the mud where it will form the seed and new plants. So we never see a shriveled or brown water lily. So in a way, they're the kind of sign of useful perfection. And man, aren't they perfect? Look at that. That's gorgeous. My friend and I, we, we just gaze at it. We can't how believe. many pictures do we have? Yeah, how many pictures do we have? And of course, we have the yellow pond lily, too. Some people call it spatter dock. 
Um, it bugs really love this one. I, I can't believe I got a picture of it without flies in it. <laughs> Amazing. And if we're lucky, and we're there between 2 and 4 in the afternoon and paddling close to the shore, we might see this one in bloom. This is another St. John's wort. This is another native St. John's wort. This is called Marsh St. John's wort. It's beautiful. Colorful. Look at all the colors. Even if we, even if we miss it in bloom. It's a beautiful plant to behold. Look at the color around the leaf edges and those ruby red seed uh, uh, buds. It's just, uh, there's color, and, and in the fall, those leaves turn this brilliant coral uh, uh, pink, and, um, and the seed pods, uh, seed pods too, the achings, are also very dark red. It's a beautiful native St. John's wort. All right, now, I knew that, that Lake Bonita was pretty special because of little islands, but we were really impressed with how special that, that uh, habitat was when we came upon this tree. Well, you probably can't tell what tree I'm talking about. It's <laughs> this one. Um, by the way, that's my friend Nancy Slack, um, my research assistant. Um, she also had permission to be out there. Um, this is an American chestnut, and it's in, in full fruit. Um, covered with uh, beautiful uh, uh, furry balls. I'm not sure that those are fertile because they're the only chestnut in the area, so it doesn't get pollinated by cross pollinated, so it probably is sterile. It's something to celebrate <laughs> when we see a tree that, that we had given up on and we had lost all hope for. Um, they show resistance, they show the, the determination to continue uh, to live. And in some ways, it's a really exciting uh, reminder of how incredibly special an environment we do live in. I mean, we live in an amazing part of the world where we have such diversity of species. And we have this amazing park that is preserved now, with being almost 7,000 acres of forest, lakes, rivers, waterfalls, marshes, bog, uh, you know, just about a, a sand plain, about any kind of habitat that we could wish is ours to explore and enjoy. And um, it's also so beautiful. So I hope, I hope that you've enjoyed my presentation and, and get excited about what we have surrounding us here in the woods and on the waterways and that uh, you will be tempted to get out there and explore the trails are woods are just waiting for you. <laughs> so, uh, Follow uh, along with her adventures uh, on uh, Saratoga Woods and Waterways. Oh, uh, Saratoga Woods and Waterways. And I'll put them right here next to the donation. If you ever need a little ray of sunshine in your day, it's, it's, it's wonderful to go to her blog and just see the beautiful flowers.